Today, the EPP crew is on the 10th floor uh, in the Berlaimo. It's a building where major decisions are being made and where new laws are initiated. And we're sitting together here with the um, Vice President of the European Commission, Jurki Katainen. We would like to have a quick chat about present activities and your future plans. Good morning, Vice President, and thank you for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you very much. Looking back at your career, at your political career, you have an impressive trajectory. Uh, you've been in politics for about 24 years, which is a quarter of a century, that's a lot. During this time, you were party leader for 10 years, you served as finance minister, you served as prime minister, and then you moved to the European Commission. How was it for you to move from the national level, national politics, to the EU politics? My God, you make me feel very old. A quarter of the century in politics it sounds very, very long time, but maybe it's true. Well, actually, the change from national to European politics was quite easy because EU matters have always been part of my portfolios as a finance minister and as a prime minister. Depending on the week, it took some 10 to 40% of my uh, working time to deal with the uh, EU matters. So I knew the substance more or less when I came here. But of course, being vice president of the commission is a different job than being a minister in national level. We have to focus here more to Europe. In other words, we have to take a um, larger view and larger perspective, not only national perspective to various files with which we are working. So um, it was quite easy. But I must say also that it was uh, very fascinating. I have always been uh, obsessed with the future of Europe and I, I really found it interesting and I have enjoyed a lot to be part of European structures. As we know, the College of Commissioners is appointed uh, for a five-year mandate. And this year, uh, we, you are in this job for two years and a half, so it means half of the mandate. How has it been so far? It's been very busy. It's been very challenging because there has been a lot of both internal but also external pressure and challenges which we have to face. But at the same time, it has been extremely uh, interesting and encouraging. We have focused on issues like digital single market, energy market union, capital market union, investment plan, circular economy especially it's uh, one of my favorite topic so we have concentrated on issues which will reshape europe uh, to be more attractive market easier for consumers better place to sell products for entrepreneurs i'm really really excited the work we have done uh, under the huge pressure there's been brexit uh, U.S. administration or U.S. elections are also uh, creating some uh, some concerns also here in Europe. Migration issues, etc., have challenged uh, whole Europe. But um, the other reality is also true that we are reshaping Europe to be more competitive, more prosperous, and, and more open for ordinary citizens. But does it mean that the challenges we've passed through as European Union? Does it mean that it made it more difficult to advance or to put in place the necessary future laws that we that would make us more competitive and better and create more jobs? Or, on the contrary, it actually um, made us all stick together and push things forward? You are right. Actually, the rising populism has challenged uh, our national uh, decision makers, governments and parliaments to make responsible decisions. This has been clearly one of the problems or challenges. But at the same time, uh, especially after Brexit referendum, EU countries are closer to each other than before. It's I don't know whether I'm glad or not, but anyway, good thing is that there is more political will to look at the future of Europe than before. So what I always... Uh, say to the ministers and prime ministers when I meet them is to is that please tell your citizens what you think about the future of Europe. You don't need to praise Commission or EU as such, but because you are a 
representative of your people. You are a re representative of owners of the EU. You are responsible of the future of Europe. So please tell to your people what you are expecting from Europe. What is Europe like uh, you would like to develop and you would like to leave for your kids? So we have gone through a lot of political challenges so far during last two and a half years but um, I'm more optimistic than two and a half years ago. How do you see the future of Europe? Already now if we are counting digital single market, energy market union, capital market union, our cooperation in external border control, our work on uh, defense policy, also when we are reshaping circular economy in, in Europe, EU and Europe will be more integrated and more united than it is today. And all these changes will happen within three to five years. Today I think that there are more Europeans who think that we must be ready to defend integration and defend uh, unified Europe because uh, most of the citizens doesn't want to have a nationalistic Europe or disintegrated Europe, fragmented Europe. Instead they want to have free Europe more united, easier to operate, easier to, to, to work and seek jobs or sell products or buy products or, or being Rasmus student going abroad to study. So that's why I think there's a stronger ownership amongst the citizens at the moment towards the future of Europe than what was the case, let's say, a year ago. This year we're celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Economic and Monetary Union, the EMU as we call it. And you've worked a lot in the past few years on developing the EMU. If we look back at 25 years of EMU, can you tell us what has been accomplished? What have we learned from this experience and what next? Yeah, first on EMU, what EMU is about? It means two things. The first thing is that EMU is uh, euro, our currency. And the second, it's the governance, how to govern EMU and our currency to be stable. So what we have learned during last years is that we have to put focus on national structural reforms because world around us is changing all the time and our societies must change accordingly. So even though EMU has uh, brought stability to the citizens and to member states and it has lowered interest rates for uh, ordinary citizens and entrepreneurs, it is not sustainable if societies are not reformed uh, according to the, the changes in the world. So this is number one lessons learned. The second thing is that uh, we need uh, some security arrangements, meaning that if some of our member states get in trouble, we must have firepower to support it. We need solidarity within the EMU. So I would say these two things, because we need both national responsibility, but also EU-wide uh, solidarity. Here in the Brussels bubble, almost everyone has heard of EMU or knows what it means. But when you go to member states, especially in the Eurozone, and you talk to your citizens from different regions, how would you explain to them in very simple terms what EMU is about and how it benefits them? EMU means euro, our own currency, and it's in everybody's interest to govern it a way which keeps, keeps it stable. So currency is not something which has created 25 years ago, and it's there forever, unless you don't take care of uh, the basics of it. So currency is stable and strong only if its users, in other words, member states are strong. This is what EMU is in nutshell. Our currency and the way to govern it so that it's uh, the most stable and strong currency. But if a citizen comes to you and and asks, how does EMU improve my life? How it benefits me because I don't feel the added value? What would be your answer? I would answer that it's very good if you don't feel anything. Because uh, <laughs> EMU is then rightly designed and it functions properly 
if you don't have any particular currency related problems. So if interest rates are reasonable, if uh, your purchase power is reasonable vis-a-vis -vis the other currency unions, then everything is fine. The less you have to worry about EMU or Euro, the better. A lot of people have been affected by the 2008 economic and financial crisis. We have put in place the right laws um, to make us more resilient and better prepared for the future challenges. But still, despite having managed to recover from this crisis, a lot of people in the member states did not feel this recovery. In your opinion, where do we need to take next the EMU so that all people feel this recovery? Actually, Euro area member states have helped the countries in trouble quite significantly. Let's look at Spain or Ireland or Cyprus or, or Portugal. Those countries have managed to come out of the crisis. Of course, there are still uh, problems like high unemployment, which must be addressed in national level. In Greece, other member states have um, guaranteed their loans. They, in, in initial states, uh, they loaned money to Greece because Greece could not raise money from the market. Uh, Eurozone has decided to cut uh, the debt a few years ago. And many member states have expressed extreme solidarity towards Greece and its citizens. But uh, the other countries cannot do the things or national reforms on behalf of uh, Greek authorities. So that's why EMU can be successful and help ordinary citizens only if there are national responsibility, in other words, if national authorities are doing necessary reforms in time, and if there is um, a strong solidarity amongst the member states. So there are some positive signs also increase in terms of economic growth and tax revenues and job creation, but of course um, we would like to see faster and better development, and this is about politics. So we support all the efforts in Greece to have responsible uh, decisions because it's uh, it's important for ordinary, ordinary Greeks. My last question is, um, I'm going to go a bit to the light side and we'll stop talking about economy. Your friends are telling us that uh, you're an accomplished chef and you really like to cook as a Finn in Brussels. Do you miss the Finnish cuisine and or what do you like to cook and what cuisine do you like? If you would have been a commissioner, would you consider becoming a chef? Well, actually, uh, when I was younger, I mean, before I went to high school, I was close to apply to, to cook school. So I really love cooking. It's, um, I cannot draw or paint or, or sing very well, <laughs> but uh, cooking is something very concrete. It's totally different to uh, different than my work, which is more or less abstract most Still of the art. time. Still art, yes. So my favorite dish is uh, politus risotto or sep risotto. And of course, uh, you can get very good uh, stuff from Italy. Italy is uh, a mecca of risottos. I love uh, Italy because of wood and because of many other things. I, to some extent, I miss Finnish cuisine too, because um, Finnish cuisine is very pure. So uh, the tastes and ingredients came, come directly from nature, like mushrooms and berries and game, uh, lake fish, etc. So I love those ingredients. If I should write at the moment to buy uh, tickets somewhere in Europe to have a fantastic dinner or lunch, I would buy tickets to San Sebastian in Spain. <laughs> So I love Pinchasis a lot, and they have excellent uh, little pubs or bars uh, which are full of uh, lovely Pinchasis. That's great tips for us too. Thank you very much for your time, man. Good luck. Thank you.